I'm a neurologist, um, trained in movement disorder, so that's what I do. I, I've always been intrigued um, on, 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 on ideas that could quantify human, human function. And, and what better than just, uh, just movement? I'm a father of two. Uh, I live in Boston. Uh, I flew here on a 777 full of uh, marathon runners. I thought that I was fit, but forget it. Forget it. So, um, delighted to be here. Uh, I'm also a, a big Star Trek fan, so that, that has inspired my uh, digital aspirations. So, uh, a lot of things uh, Captain Kirk and uh, Sulu and others have figured out way before we, uh, we ever got into it. Um, now perhaps uh, uh, warped speed and, and teleportation is our next big thing, but you know, we'll see. I uh, have to start my presentation. I hate slides. I don't like slides, but uh, people make me, make me do them. So I hope they, uh, they look good. OK, um, I'm not, this, you know, a couple of disclaimers here. Yes, a couple of disclaimers here. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be um, um, expressing the views of Teva. Teva is a pharmaceutical company. Uh, I also have an appointment of Ma in, at Mass General Hospital. Uh, these are my own, my own personal views, and they have nothing to do with standards and regulations. So these are uh, thoughts, collected thoughts on, on digital. And I'm going to be, I'm going to try to convince you that in drug development and in the way we make drugs and do clinical research, uh, digital health, uh, e-health, m-health is not everything. It's just a small part of what is needed, but it's a very, very critical part. Um, you all know that the world is changing. Um, there is, uh, without a doubt, uh, a, a big transformation that is happening that is technology enabled, uh, and it's, it's definitely affecting healthcare. There is convergence of technology and healthcare that is ongoing. This is not new. Convergence have started about, about uh, 20 years ago. Um, uh, the lines are not, are not there yet, and it will take some people talk about the eternal journey of convergence between technology and, and health, simply because technology travels at different speeds uh, than health and, and, and uh, health advances. So it's, uh, it's uh, perhaps an aspirational goal to think that we can, uh, we can fully align them, but it's worth, uh, it's worth the effort. Uh, so uh, for, the fifth, for the next about 15 minutes, um, I'm, I'm gonna try to convince you that we've made a lot of strides and there's a lot of opportunity, but I'm gonna try to communicate some of the major, major challenges. But before doing so, I always like to start with a vision of the future. So what are we looking to create here? What is our end goal? Is our end goal to uh, cure disease? Is our end goal to um, um, produce better drugs? So I have a short movie here, uh, which I don't take credit for. Uh, some of some of the colleagues of mine at Teva take all the credit, but it reflects and it gives a, um, a, a sense of vision in what we're trying to do in everyday life and everyday healthcare, and that's what drug development is all about. I, I said that sometimes it works, sometimes 95% of the times I'm, you know, there you go, we might. So this is an asthma patient trying to go to sleep, making uh, uh, plans to visit uh, his mother next morning. He goes to sleep, and then suspense starts happening. About 2 a.m., he starts feeling something, tossing and turning, <coughs> coughing. I think it's a, an asthma attack. His inhaler is next to him. He takes it, it's e-connected, gives immediate feedback on his lung function, connects it to the allergens and the local forecast, and then sends an alert that something is not going well. It's predicting more challenge. Immediately the system connects it to the physician, 
where there's an instant diagnosis and an instant intervention. The physician prescribes steroids and the patient goes to the 3D printer. He takes the steroids, he's done his rescue inhalers, he goes back to sleep. And that's the end of the story. And perhaps, perhaps, he might be able to get to his date with his mother. Everything seems under control. Sleep patterns, oxygen saturation, heart rate, everything that Michael showed. They both wake up. And they prepare for the date. But there's another surprise waiting. The mother is a diabetic and the system is preparing for her her daily dose of anti-diabetic medication. A lot of them, all at the same time. These are mostly censored, enabled pills. They know the system and the platform knows that they were ingested But a wearable closed loop system monitors glucose and glucose is still high. Thank God there is a implantable multi-well chip that can deliver additional boost in controlling glucose. And there you go. What could have been a disaster on multiple fronts was diverted. And that's a nice story. And by the way, we're not all that far from this story. It's actually reality. We have closed loop systems that can monitor and intervene um, and, and, and modulate um, blood glucose. So this is not science fiction. Okay, I must admit some of it is, but, um, uh, but I, I don't wanna ruin all the fun here. Okay. So I'm gonna resume the presentation and I'm gonna try to avoid uh, repetition. You know, we all know that technology and big data analytics and artificial intelligence um, are rapidly evolving, evolving, and and we all know that uh, mostly everything can nowadays be be measured uh, by wearables, uh, digestibles, implantables, whatever you name it. Uh, there is there is a lot of hype. There is a lot of promise there, um, and 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 people are being equipped with all sorts of interesting consumer uh, great technologies to, uh, to do so. Um, however, how ready are we to apply this change big time? And thinking about clinical research, how ready are we to implement some of the, uh, these paradigms in clinical research? I personally believe that we are, we are ready and we are getting uh, better um, every moment. We are all equipped with smartphones. Um, physicians and patient relationship is changing. Physicians, uh, patients' attitudes towards healthcare is, is changing. Uh, physician, uh, patients are becoming a lot more engaged, a lot more involved, a lot more educated. Uh, they turn to social media for, for answers. So they are actually adopting a lot of what's happening and they're consuming a lot of what's happening. So for you that manage patients, there are a lot of educated patients out there and a lot more to come, especially as the generations uh, evolve and we're now at, at, at the digital native uh, generation. When, when these people come to age and they, they will very soon, this transformation will be um, um, almost complete. So the, the, the environment is ready, the environment is ripe. Physicians have already adopted technology. Of course, they complain a lot about it. They spend a lot of time on uh, electronic medical records. They uh, tend to get their education online. Uh, they're very comfortable with using, using technology and they're um, ready, somehow ready, almost ready. They're never gonna be fully ready uh, because they're not taught um, uh, digital medicine in med school, so they have to self-educate, but they're getting um, uh, they're, they're getting ready. 
So everyone is, is ready. Patients are ready to adopt. Physicians are there. Uh, but unfortunately, the sad reality is that we're still doing the same um, things in, in clinical development. So trials and the clinical uh, development cascade is long. Uh, it takes about 10 to 15 years and several billion dollars to uh, uh, complete. In many instances, uh, our, our inability to detect drug efficacy is a limitation of development itself and the process itself. Uh, and it's not uh, pharmacology. So at times, it's the how we do clinical development and how we develop drugs rather than the what we develop that is broken. So bad trials, biased approaches, uh, insensitive measures, operational failures uh, are just a few of the things uh, that define success or failure in clinical development. Uh, and the price of failure is very, uh, very high. So the clinical trial enterprise has remained relatively unchanged, again, for 20 or 30 years. And uh, it's all centered around sites and physicians. Patients are enrolled in physical sites, um, scattered ac across different states and countries. And we keep on equipping the sites with uh, and investing in sites more and more. And, and this enterprise is becoming more expensive because we're uh, investing in more uh, sensing, techno in, in, more, in more infrastructure for the sites and not to the patients. I got it. Um, the average cost per drug is um, about $5.5 billion for big companies. Smaller companies can get away with less. Um, and the average cost of failure is $1.2 billion if the drug fails late stage in phase three. As a result, um, our productivity has failed, has fallen tremendously. Um, the number of new approvals is overall declining uh, despite increasing costs. Here's a, a depiction of the a graph on the number of drugs approved in the US per billion dollars spent. And, and you can see it has nearly halved ev roughly every nine years. And that's not all. Um, during a six-month trial, that's the average duration of a trial, let's say it's six months, a participant spends about 4,380 hours experiencing the effects of an experimental drug, uh, and only about 50 hours providing information about his experiences in site visits. So there is a lot of wasted resource and a lot of wasted effort. So information captured during these patient visits um, uh, at sites are full of recall bias, um, and they add to and to add to the complex to, to this complexity, they're subject to interpretation. So uh, it is it is despite our best efforts, uh, we're only left with artificial snapshots of uh, data that uh, we are called to make decisions upon, and that costs the system billions and millions of dollars. So what about the rest of the time? What about the rest? 4,300 plus hours of lost information and the cost to patients and families that have to travel to sites and, and have to uh, change their schedule. So it's, uh, it's um, uh, a, a, a broken system. So we're left with uh, an, an unsustainable drug development paradigm. Too long, too expensive. It's definitely not fun for patients. Um, that, by the way, they are called subjects when they go to a research site, subject X and subject uh, Y. They don't even receive a thank you letter at the end of the day. So it's a, a broken system. No one is happy. Healthcare system, payers, no one is happy. Um, uh, imagine how do I, I mean, how people in my position feel when we are uh, asked to work on something that has about 5% chance of success uh, in, the, in the beginning as we're entering this cascade, uh, and it takes us 10 to 12 years to complete it. So, uh, not fun, not fun. mHealth could make clinical development better, smarter, um, but it's not just mHealth. Um, and we can, there are so many different approaches that help adherence, you can uh, find gamification, uh, approaches, uh, ways to improve training, telemedicine, use social media, electronic consenting, uh, smart pills, closed loop de deliveries, and, and biometric monitoring. Um, 
uh, to improve uh, the drug development cascade. This is not enough. We still need good drugs. Uh, we, need, we need effective therapies. Uh, we need to identify the right mechanisms, uh, have uh, the right tools, and combine with omics and biomarkers uh, to make the process uh, uh, successful. It's not easy. It takes a lot of infrastructure. Uh, it takes uh, building of a cloud um, uh, a, 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 with, with multiple layers, uh, integrating data, aggregating and analyzing data. Um, it's very expensive, and it also uh, takes a, uh, a mindset change, especially in pharma. Um, it's not business as usual for pharma. Uh, we need to have a vision, a plan. We have to agree to take risks. Uh, we have to change the way we um, uh, structure our processes to make them adaptable, work together, share more, and build the right infrastructure. And perhaps if we're successful, we're going to be able to transform healthcare uh, in the process. So, so this is my list of challenges, and we can have um, as much conversations as as, many, as much conversation as, as you like during our panel or. Uh, after, after the talk. Um, this is not to discourage anyone, but uh, for, for us in, in drug development, um, behavioral challenges, institutional challenges, technological channel challenges, regulatory, operational, data-related challenges, scientific and access challenges all apply. So we have to slowly solve each and every single challenge, and for everything we solve, there is another challenge that comes up. Um, one of my favorite is the behavioral challenge, and it's very tightly connected to the mindset. We have to convince ourselves that there is no other path forward. Uh, that's why the long introduction, and that's why the vision. Uh, the hurdles are there, but uh, they're there to be, to be um, uh, um, tackled, and uh, the transformation has already started. So a lot of companies have um, including, including the, the you know, Teva and Pfizer, it's a company that worked before Teva, have taken on the challenge of uh, pushing the envelope in the digital space. Again, that's, these are my two minutes, and uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me and for uh, your attention. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. So, uh, one of the, in listening to your talk, one of the things I was so struck by was... Um, sort of, I would say, the contrast between the um, almost the relentless optimism and the reality on the ground in pharma research, which you acknowledge, but, you know, if the you're right that there are digital health or mobile health studies that are underway, um, and we actually talked about this on our podcast with uh, the, the people who direct M Health at, at Metadata, you know, who, who are leaders in some of these, coordinating some of these studies, but most of them are very exploratory. They're sort of proof of concept, they're sort of, you know, in endocrine you might say like pseudo-pseudo-hypo-para studies. I mean, they're, they're very, um, you know, preliminary. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the question is, um, is it because, you, you highlight here a huge number of potential problems. Hmm. Is it fundamentally that the, many of the wearables and the technologies are kind of consumer grade and aren't robust enough for use in rigorous clinical research? Or do you think it's more the mindset issue that you talk about and that as long as they're perceived to be alternatives, pe people are gonna continue to do what they always have done with the feeling that there's more regulatory security there? I think it's either or. I, I, I strongly believe that there is no business case for, uh, for digital health currently. And that's that limiting- seems like a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's, it's not science, it's not research, uh, it's not technology, it's not analytics, it's just lack of business case. So there's who's no going to pay but, for but it? To take what you're saying, but there's no value. I mean, you just presented, I'm not trying to be difficult here, but you presented a slide. I mean, I'm fascinated by this. But you present a slide that essentially says, you know, 95% of the data are being missed. There's no business case for capturing that value? No, but yeah, the, how, how do you monetize capturing 95% of more data? Right, so I mean, that's sort of the issue. Is it, is, is, that's really the issue. Is there some real value in that? That, that, that that's, that's a major, major issue. The reality, the scientific reality is that we, our, our, our clinical research is outdated, 
clean there should be bad. value there. I mean, there should be value there, right? I mean, if we're preaching that, oh, it's all about continuous and not episodic, but you can capture the value just as well at an occasional visit, and you can't demonstrate the value of all the intermediate. intermediate Absolutely. So we're in the beginning of it all. Okay. We are in the I beginning. I want to make sure we get to the questions. I apologize. Uh, and Robert both Mc questions this time. Robert McBurney from the iConquer MS People Powered Research Network. Um, there is a parallel movement, in fact, a very similar uh, s business case issue. So there's a parallel movement that's going on in healthcare, which is learning health, learning health systems and learning health communities. And if I look at the challenges of learning health communities, they're the same challenges exactly. as that you have up, up, up there. So how do you see this proprietary uh, drug development process merging or going hand in hand with the emerging learning health system movement? Okay, that, that's, that's a very, very important question. And uh, just my, 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 my two cents here, I've give, I'm giving talks about healthcare and drug development and they always converge. And the set of challenges are indeed the same. These are the set of challenges that we're facing as we're trying to transform healthcare. My bias is that I think clinical research will transform healthcare and not the other way around. So we have to prove and we have to learn how to walk before we run. We're now crawling. And unless we prove value and we do all the necessary studies to prove value of digital platforms in, in the actual research setting, this paradigm or these paradigms are never going to be adopted by healthcare big time. So that, that's, my, that's my bias. Talking to other folks, they think the opposite should happen. And that's, that's another value proposition. Okay, I want to, we missed you last time. I want to get your question now and then yours and then we'll get to the next speaker. Sure, hi, I'm um, Dexter Hadley. I'm faculty at UCSF and I find myself in a big data AI sort of research environment. And my, um, I've been following Mike's work at the quantified self for a few years now. And my question is quite simple. So I think the problem with deriving value is we have real, really poor labels. From an AI perspective, we need good outcomes. And just sensors and, and data, more data upon data, is, it doesn't really get us to a, an impactful label. So how is it that, that we can stop, um, we could sort of increase the specificity of what we're doing, right? So there, there are many different outcomes physicians sort of deal with, common ones being common, like taking um, Steroids for asthma is a, is a pretty common outcome, but how do we get to the rare outcomes with this kind of sensor and mobile health push if we really can't quantify them? The patient themselves can't quantify such an outcome. It's almost as though we have to go after the people with the knowledge, the physicians are the ones that are, are going to quantify this outcome, but they're not caught up in this digital health craze like, like physicians are. So it seems like we could never um, get a level of specificity to, to derive value, but so to speak, one without thing, proper outcomes. There, there, it's a, this is, these are all very valid points, and, and we have to be more specific, more sensitive. We need to do what we do now better, but the value is really going to be driven by what we don't know now. So if, if, I, if I, uh, AI and digital can deliver something that is not obvious to humans or not immediately obvious to us, if they can deliver the unknown, the unexpected, something that will make the car into a spaceship or something that will make a, a horse into a car, then value is not going to be um, obvious, obviously there for us. I think a real transformation is needed. And we're not there at the tipping point yet. Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. It's also a great panel discussion point, too. But I, my own view is we do need to capture that data that you're arguing is missing. We do need to see how often events are happening, how many are false positives, how many are true positives. And I think there's enough people are motivated. We could, should be able to organize studies that do capture that in some useful fashion. I think... Let's, let's come back to this yeah. panel. With Sounds like a good panel topic. Why don't we <laughs> get to it later? Yeah. yeah. I want to get to your question as well. Yeah. Uh, Rob McRae, Wireless Life Sciences Alliance. Um, so looking at the 95% of data that is not captured because there's no economic model, if you, um, and I know this is just your personal opinion, but 
thing about regulated drug companies, if there was a way where you could envision that um, you could reduce that pre-market investment by a substantial amount, a third to 50%, would that create the economic model to capture that information and actually utilize it? Obviously, the concept being that they are linked by capturing that information and using it and uh, uh, determining the safety and eff effectiveness of the product, you get faster to market and you know continuously. There is, and that's improve. that's the current business model model that that we're pushing: faster and better, uh, because it's not necessarily cheaper. It's actually more expensive. Uh, the last deployment. Of a, of a digital platform in a trial, which is, was actually a registrational trial. I had a case study, no time, little time. Uh, some other, I, I'm happy to, to share the case study with anyone that is interested. It's a collaboration between our group at Teva and Intel. Um, uh, cost us $4 million for, six patient, for 60 patients, $4 million to build it, deploy it, just to collect exploratory data. But this is in the context of validating and using on the go. It's not piloting. I, I detest piloting. I think this is what got us here in the first place. Okay. Thank um, you.